Hi, everybody. It's great to see a big crowd. My name's Toby McLeod. I'm really honored to be with you tonight, do this keynote talk, um, which is going to be about the last eight years, the struggle in Berkeley to protect the West Berkeley Shell Mound. Just a couple words about myself. Um, I went to Yale and studied history and came out here to the UC Berkeley Graduate School of Journalism and heard about coal strip mining out in Hopi and Navajo country and started making a film and suddenly realized the history I'd learned at Yale was very different from the history I heard from the Hopi and the Navajo elders. And it led to me having a career 45 years of collaborating with indigenous communities to help protect their sacred places because there seemed to be a need for public education amongst what I would call my people about the importance of these places that have such great cultural significance for indigenous people. And lo and behold, the best answer, I got a lot of questions after films. I made a film called In the Light of Reverence, which was about the Hopi, the Lakota, and the Wintu up at Mount Shasta trying to protect their lands. And then I made a four-part series called Standing on Sacred Ground Global. Um, eight communities, Hawaii, Peru, Ethiopia, Papua New Guinea, Canada. Um, and the best answer I ever came up to the question, what can I do, was work under the leadership of Native people in the community you live in to protect or restore a sacred place. And lo and behold, I came home to Berkeley in 2016, kind of burned out, having finished the films I really wanted to make. And I got a phone call from Sophie Hahn, who was on the zoning board at Berkeley, saying, you need to get some Ohlone leaders and Malcolm Margolin, who wrote The Ohlone Way, and come hear what's proposed for the West Berkeley Shell Mound site, which Stephanie Manning, who has been working with Baja for 40 years, had spent a lot of time getting landmarked by the city of Berkeley back in the year 2000. And so Karina Gould, who's an Ohlone uh, Confederated Villages of Lejeune local leader, a wonderful person who you're gonna hear a lot about in my talk, uh, and Malcolm Margolin and I went and heard a horror story about the plans to build a five-story luxury condo building, which would require digging down 11 feet into this culturally significant landscape where 400 burials had been removed over the last hundred years or so, uh, according to local historian Richard Schwartz. And so we got involved and Stephanie and I and several other people uh, literally had about 60 meetings, strategy meetings over the last eight years with Karina Gould at the David Brower Center and on Zoom during the COVID crisis to try to figure out how do we raise consciousness in Berkeley you know, it's an amazing, you all probably have experienced this, but, you know, everybody, and there's, there's a pretty intellectual community and everybody's pretty how, pretty proud of their knowledge of history. But when you would explain to people that where Strawberry Creek flowed into the bay, there was a village for 5,700 years and the Ohlone people lived off of the oysters and the clams and the salmon, and they built these massive shell mounds and buried their dead in the shell mounds. I would find most Berkeley people shaking their heads and saying, oh, I had no idea. And 5,700 years is a pretty long time. So our job was to try to get the word out and tell the story uh, as we tried to build support for this culturally significant site. And I have a PowerPoint to show you tonight to tell you the story and also um, a couple of films that we made along the way um, because during COVID, filmmaking became virtually impossible, but Karina Gould would have these prayer ceremonies down at 1900 Fourth Street, which most of you know is Spenger's parking lot, 2.2 acre site. And it just evolved over, over time that we would make a film about mo you know different events that happened there and try to tell the story. I'll show you some of those films tonight. And I, I also want to shout out to the uh, Berkeley City Council Sophie Hahn, who I've mentioned, and Mayor Jesse Ottagine, because it, without their unwavering support for eight years, including uh, $1.5 million at the end, we would not have succeeded. It took a real collaborative, concerted effort in support of this place and the Ohlone 
and I'm going to use the word alone, even though it's not necessarily the the best word to use these days, but it's the commonly known, you know, framing for the different cultures around the Bay. Um, so I'm really honored to be able to tell you this story tonight, and I'm going to share my screen and start this PowerPoint. Part of the job was to graphically tell the story, the history of the site, why it's culturally significant. So I'm going to walk you through some maps here tonight, and I'm not going to dwell too much on the, the further back history. I'm going to talk mostly about the last eight years, but let's at least look at the Ohlone uh, culture groups, each one speaking a different language around the bay. You can see the little red arrow uh, pointing out where we are. Those are the different Bay Area cultures who were here in the 1600s when the Spanish arrived. And these are some of the place names. Huchion is Berkeley. It's where we are. It's the region that we all live in, Huchion. And um, some beautiful names that are some of them coming back now. And the story of the shell mounds gained the interest of an archaeologist, Nels Nelson, in the early 1900s. And he found 425 shell mounds all around the bay. And he numbered the Berkeley shell mound, number 307. And that number is sort of the official archaeological designation for the West Berkeley shell mound. We had a San Francisco Chronicle uh, map maker, John Blanchard, do an updated version of the shell mound which has never really been published. We were hoping we'd eventually get this into the Chronicle, but uh, they they never published it. But it's a, it's a different look, modern look. This is one of the only photographs. It's the oldest photograph of the what was left of the of the West Berkeley Shell Mound around 1907, when the industrial buildings were surrounding it. And um, while the Emeryville Shell Mound was the biggest around the bay. Uh, West Berkeley Shell Mound was the oldest. The, the village there is the first village around San Francisco Bay uh, that we know of. There may be some underwater as the waters rose after the glaciers melted. But um, for perspective in Emeryville, they built a dance hall on top of their shell mound. They had a train stop there. And as some of the folks who have been working on the shell mound comment, um, tourists and local people would dance on the cemetery and the graves of the indigenous people of this area there at Shell Mound Park. And the Emeryville Shell Mound was basically taken down in 1924, but this is a couple photographs to give you some perspective of the scale of these mounds that would grow over thousands of years at these Ohlone villages. We made some maps because we were up against private property developers who said from the very beginning that this site had no cultural significance, that the shell mound was located somewhere else. And so we decided we we had to tell the story of the significance of the entire cultural village shell mound complex, which extended, as you will see from these maps, all around this area. And you'll get familiar with, with where we are here in a second. But this was a U.S. Coast Survey map. Thomas Jefferson started the Coast Survey. And a very diligent scientists mapped every inch of the U.S. coast. And they put the shell mounds that were at the West Berkeley site on the map. And so we, des we designed these maps to sort of visually tell the story of the growth of Berkeley around this site and why the Spengers parking lot was so important. So you can see the streets of Berkeley coming in here in the in the late 1800s. Um, the whole area was a Spanish land grant. And then after the US-Mexican War, uh, settlers came in during the gold rush. And the folks from affiliated with UC Berkeley who bought most of West Berkeley put a park in there in the core of this probably wonderful area to draw private, you know, people to buy the land and build houses in that area. But then they, the, the railroad came through in 1877 and they built 
they cut Fourth Street right through the middle of the park in 1881. And so the development continued there. And there's where Spenger's parking lot is in relation as the landfill pushed out to the west. This was the original landmark boundary in 2000 that Stephanie Manning helped establish, but the westernmost property owners fought the designation, so it was shrunken down a little bit. And the whole thing was made eligible for the National Register of Historic Places after the landmark status was affirmed. And the archaeologists were looking around, affirming the incredible cultural significance of this whole area. And again, as I as I say, we're, we're making these maps to try to show how important culturally this site is. And um, Nels Nelson, whose photograph you saw before, walked the area and he if you can see my arrow here this dotted line is what he thought was the shell mound boundary and here's the land that we're going to be talking about here for the next half hour this black area was all that was left of the shell mound in 1907 and we're going to see some photos of that in a few minutes but this was where nels nelson thought the shell mound extended and as we fought the developers and tried to protect the site, we we you know we just had to come up with every image we could to try to show the cultural significance. So this is pretty much everything all in one image. And it didn't seem to matter to um, just to clarify the history of the development proposal. The first proposal was a luxury condo development that needed CEQA approval and permits from the city of Berkeley. And uh, Karina Gould and her allies got 1,800 letters opposing that project, and the developers walked away. This was around 2017, 2000, I'm sorry, yeah, 2018. But then the owners came back using the uh, SB 35, uh, Scott Wiener's bill that said, if you propose housing that's more than 50% affordable housing, you can bypass the local permit process. It has to be approved. And uh, there were some exemptions. If there's a endangered species, a toxic waste dump, or a quote unquote historic structure. So we urge the city of Berkeley to not grant the SB 35 permit based on the fact that even though it had been leveled and was now under the parking lot, um, this was a historic structure on this site. And um, just to go back a little bit more history, in 1950, UC Berkeley archaeologists, when, they, when the shell mound was about to be removed, the little black section I showed you on Nels Nelson's map, the archaeologists went in there and they dug into it and they removed 95 human burials of that from that last little section and 3,400 cultural, what we call artifacts, what Karina Gould calls ancestors, literally some of these beautiful pieces, which you can see here. These are from um, both West Berkeley Shell Mound and Emeryville. These were buried with the dead in the Shell Mound. And um, Malcolm Margolin was able to get a show at the uh, Berkeley Art Museum a few years ago to bring these things out and show them uh, to the public for the first time. Um, our story of resistance uh, at the West Berkeley Shell Mound really started when uh, another sacred site, Segorite, on the Carquina Strait was threatened by a park and toilets and pavement. And Karina Gould and her supporters uh, occupied the site for 109 days. And Karina had been leading walks around the bay to all the different Shell Mound sites trying to do public education. And this event really raised consciousness. And it, it, Karina says it changed her DNA, the ceremony, the prayer, the, the support. Uh, she came away really feeling differently about the importance of protecting these, these village sites. This is what was proposed in the first project. Um, synchronistically and amazingly enough, about two weeks after that we went to that zoning board hearing, Spengers was trenching to build Lululemon across the street there on 4th Street, and they unearthed four human burials uh, within two weeks of us learning about this pro project. And Karina said at the time, 
this is the ancestors giving themselves up and revealing themselves and kind of crying out for help and saying that we really can't let this development proceed on this parking lot. And this is uh, Ohlone elder Ruth Orta and Vince Medina, who has started Ohlone Cafe, and Karina uh, going over some of the points in the letters. Uh, again, they were, we got 1,800 letters opposing the project. There were five in favor. And this is what sort of chased the first developers away. Karina sponsored and hosted a dozen prayer ceremonies with Jewish rabbis and Tibetan Buddhists and um, you know dancers from the Aztec country. Uh, it was an amazing sequence of, of events to build awareness at the site. Uh, this is a group of uh, Native Hawaiian Pua case at the far left, uh, Kaleen Sisk, Winamam Wintu chief on the far right with Karina and um, Wounded Knee Dale Campo, uh, another Bay Area leader, uh, leading a prayer walk at the site. We were challenged early on by people who said, well, what is the alternative? What would you rather do there? And Chris Walker, who's responsible for most of the graphics that you've seen, the, the maps, he and I worked on all of this together. Uh, he came up with this idea with Karina to daylight Strawberry Creek and put a cultural center that resembles a mound there on the corner. And this image, at first we were worried because you just don't propose something like this in Indian country. You have debates and discussions and you'd see how everybody feels about it. But we introduced this as a concept and it just took off. Everybody loved it. And this has become kind of the iconic image of what we're now proposing for the site. And within, a, again, a few weeks back then, Ruth Orta and Karina went to the Landmarks Commission in Berkeley, because after all, it is a landmark. So if we were going to propose anything for it, we wanted the Landmarks Commission to be on board. And um, what I'm going to do now is um, show you a two-minute film uh, narrated by Karina, which uh, tells the story using Chris's animation and I'll come back at the end and uh, we'll continue. The city of Berkeley started on the shores of what we now call the San Francisco Bay. Before the university, before California cuisine, before landfills and parking lots, my people settled here in Huchin. More than 5,000 years ago, my Ohlone ancestors built the first fishing village on the bay. At the heart of it was a freshwater creek and two massive shell mounds. Archaeologists officially recorded a boundary for the site in 2003, making it eligible for the National Register of Historic Places. After the gold rush, the Spanger family built a restaurant and Strawberry Creek flowed right through their grotto. The shell mounds were scraped away to fertilize farm fields and pave city streets. In 1907, the site was studied and mapped by archaeologist Nels Nelson. It was landmarked by the city of Berkeley in 2000. Today, the heart of our ancient village is threatened by a five-story retail and condo project. But we have a different vision for the best use of this land, a green space and a cultural park in this one area left unbuilt, a 2.2 acre parking lot known as 1900 Fourth Street, my people still go to remember our ancestors with prayer and ceremony. This is where people lived and died, laughed and cried, and buried our ancestors in the shell mounds. Aluni people are still here, and we have a vision for this sacred site not for the commercial development being proposed, but a green space with flowing water, a memorial park where we can rebury our ancestors who were taken away to museums, a place for reflection and ceremony for all. On the top, my people could see fires built on shell mounds across the bay. This is where we sang the old one spirits out through the western gate. This is the birthplace of Berkeley. So 
So the vision for this site now includes daylighting Strawberry Creek, which is shown on Nels Nelson's map there on the left. You can see it flowed right through that parking lot before it was covered. And now Strawberry Creek flows underneath University Avenue. So one of our goals is to, to bring that water back to its natural course. And um, this is the vision. I'm just gonna run through the vision of what we in, what we would like to do there, what it looks like, uh, what the steps are. And um, this is a PowerPoint I prepared before we actually got the land back. So there you can see our first, the first step finally has been accomplished. And um, the vision is not to dig down out of respect for what's underneath, but there is modern fill across that area. And so we're going to build up and not down. And uh, again, that the challenge of bringing the water from underneath University Avenue through a cultural site is not an insignificant challenge. But uh, I think free flowing water through there will be an incredible, an incredible thing for that space. And Karina's very excited about that. Um, another challenge is raising all the money to build the park. I'll just jump right through that one. That's a lot of money. Um, perhaps the most, to me, significant or serious aspect of this, this is a vision for the cultural center with a theater in the middle, but the turquoise area up at the top there, one of the big goals is to bring those 95 ancestors back from UC Berkeley. UC Berkeley has more than 10,000 human remains in their possession and NAGPRA, the federal law requires them to return all of them. And it's a very delicate process, but uh, the basic protocol, uh, and this is yet again, another just reminder of, of when those 95 ancestors were taken. But the indigenous protocol is to bring those ancestors back as close as they can be returned to where they were taken from. And so we have this cross section, this idea to, to put them in the ground as close to the shell mound as possible. And it's a very delicate um, diplomatic challenge we have to do that. But this first step was incredibly exciting. I hope you all heard about it a few weeks ago. The Berkeley City Council voted unanimously to contribute some money and to buy the West Berkeley Shell Mound from the owner for $27 million. I'm going to show you a little film about that in a minute. Um, and it was an incredibly emotional experience and um, a great a national victory for Indigenous people. So again, this is a little bit longer film. I hope I hope you enjoy it. And um, we'll wrap it up after that. Here we go. A landmark settlement has been reached between the city of Berkeley and Ohlone tribal leaders over an historic piece of land. Today, city leaders announced a plan to return the Ohlone Shell Mound village site in West Berkeley to an indigenous trust. You know, this week is crazy, but this last eight years have been an incredible blessing that thousands of people have been here on the Shell Mound together from all walks of life, praying here for the freedom of this place that is sacred. The special meeting of the Berkeley City Council is called to order. I want to first turn the floor over to uh, Karina Gould, who is unfortunately not able to join us in person, but she's here in full spirit. We're really excited by um, this, this opportunity to give the land back, which was stolen. Let's remember, this land was and still is indigenous land. And it's pretty uh, ridiculous that we have to take this action to buy it and give it back to the first people who lived and owned this land. Um, but I think this is a really critical step and really just want to thank you so much for everything and, and thank you for your partnership in this effort. So I'll turn it over to Karina Gould. I, I'm without words right now of where we've come in the last eight years as partners, the city of Berkeley and the LaShawn people and the thousands and thousands 
of people that showed up for the West Berkeley Shell Mound. That the next seven generations will know that this shell mound that was once stolen was returned and that there are children that we don't even know yet that will sing there. To have this place saved forever, I am beyond words. Thank you so much. And I'll turn over to Councilor Hobb. Yes, I will make a motion. Yes, I'm going to express emotion and make a motion. I first, I really want to thank Karina Gold. I'm also speechless, but I want to thank you for your incredible grace. Because to fight for something that should have been yours always, and to have the incredible generosity of spirit to be willing to go and get the money to buy back something that was taken from you and held hostage for 150 years, to be such a great teacher and friend, and to be patient with all of us as we feel our way through what it means to try and do the right thing. So I really want to thank you for the honor of working with you and of being able to do this incredible project together. So many twists and turns, so many moments when it seemed like uh, this whole thing was gonna fall apart. It is absolutely stunning to be here today. All that prayer and all that gathering and a lot of people brought enormous good intent to the site. I actually think that's the only way we could possibly be where we are today. So with that, I'm going to do what feels to me like one of the most important things I've ever done in my life. And I'm going to make this motion. I want to move that the Berkeley City Council adopt a first reading of an ordinance Authorizing the city to acquire the portion of the West Berkeley Shell Mound located at 1900 4th Street, and also authorizing the city to transfer that property to the Segorite Land Trust, thereby returning the land to the Ohlone people. On the motion, Councilmember Kesarwani. Yes. Taplin. Yes. Bartlett. Yes. Hahn. Yes. Wengraff. Yes. Humbert. Yes. And Mayor Aragin. Yes. Okay, motion, motion carries. Motion carries unanimously. We envision a new public space governed by the decision-making authority of the Segorite Land Trust and the uh, Villages of Lashon, women's leadership, a place for gathering, for ceremony. We want to restore the native landscape, daylight the creek that flows through this area. We want, yes, we want to plant native medicines, native foods, bring back the ceremonies, bring back the world renewal events. We want to be a place for global indigenous leadership to come and gather in solidarity so that we see other land rematriation and land back happening as a global movement of justice and reconciliation. We're so happy and I tell everybody that I see every day that this land is our land. We're still here, we've never left. My family's never left Alameda County, ever, since time began. And I am happy, and I am proud, and yay! And we came up with a dream, a dream of freeing the West Berkeley Shell Mound. And in doing that, she freed us. We were able to come up with the dream of what could happen there. What would that vision be to reopen up Strawberry Creek, 
to have a place where our children, not just Lashan people's children, but all of the people that live here, can reimagine what it looked like to have a creek open again, to imagine having ceremony on this land, to building up and never disturbing what's underneath, to creating a cultural center that could be there for every fourth grade child that has to learn about my ancestors, to not just learn about the history, but the resiliency of our people. Okay, almost done. Um, yeah, I, it's just a very emotional land back victory. Cost a lot of money. It's kind of absurd, as everybody said, to have to spend raise and spend so much money. But um, Karina Gould was an amazing leader throughout this eight years, and um, I think the main lesson of the whole experience was that uh, the collaboration of dozens and dozens of people, there's Stephanie down there at the lower right, that's the kind of elder brain trust that we had meeting at the Brower Center all those times. One of our big moments was getting the National Trust for Historic Preservation to name the Shell Mound site, one of the 11 most threatened historic places in America. That helped a lot. Deb Holland made a statement before she was Secretary of Interior for the press conference and, um, you know, just a lot of support from a lot of people, including, I'm sure, some of the Baja members. Thank you very much for whatever you did uh, to turn out and support this effort. And um, I'll be really happy to take questions from you. Thank you very much. It's a very moving presentation. Um, so uh, I mentioned, I think, to put your questions uh, on hold for uh, the presentation. So Maybe some of them would get answered along the way. The Q and A uh, is where your questions should go. So feel free to ask whatever you like, and I will share those questions with Toby. Let me see whether we've got some starting. Okay, right now we have no open questions. We'll give it a minute, see if anybody has any questions. I can fill the silence for a moment. Um, I showed this presentation yesterday to a class of um, master's degree students at University of California at Santa Cruz. And at the end, they they discussed what were the lessons learned. And I made a little list of um, how you need to really be tuned into public policy and awareness so that you are have an effective strategy. Um, the role of protest and um, getting media attention. Uh, the fact that Karina had a kind of a seasoned group of elders, including Stephanie. And she also had a parallel group of younger people who uh, went out at night and painted murals on that parking lot. They, they were basically trespassing. Um, the fact that we used a lawsuit uh, to delay the project for four years, we won at the first uh, level. They, the judge ruled that, yes, there is a historic structure there. Probably some of you read about this. But then that victory was overturned at the appeals court level where the judges just sort of said, haven't you all heard there's a housing crisis and this is the highest priority in, in California? And so they overturned our initial victory. Uh, but the students really identified perseverance and sort of patience over the long term. And I think they learned something. You know, you got all these 25 year olds who are struggling with what's going on on campuses these days. And they came away realizing that you have to really hang in there for a long time and pace yourself to uh, to win these these kinds of battles. So those were some of the lessons that, that have, uh, have come up. Questions? Okay, so the first one uh, is, uh, how are you able to maintain support for the effort in the current political environment? Well, that's, that's a really good question. You know, housing is a crisis in California, if that's part of what you're referring to. Um, Karina Gould made it very clear early on that she's totally in favor of housing and affordable housing but that a cultural, sacred, historic site is not the right place to build housing. So we got letters from some of the major affordable housing organizations 
Um, but I, I would say that, you know, in the, the current political climate in Berkeley um, was very supportive. We had to do education. We had to tell the story. We had to get favorable media. But the climate, if, you know, if you can't protect a place like this in Berkeley, California, then there's not much hope for other places like this. So um, we really appreciated the support from the citizens of Berkeley, the unanimous vote of the city council. And that didn't mean that Karina didn't have to meet with city council members over and over, over those eight years to keep the support. Because let's face it, they're spending public time, public money on a, on a site that, you know, it, some people would say there should be housing there. We have a housing crisis. I see Tim Barber has his hand up. Uh, um, Elizabeth, should we just unmute Tim and let him ask his question? How do you want to do that? So I'm an architect in LA, but I'm a member and I'm moving to Berkeley, but I'm from Chillicothe, Ohio, where there is a, a site called Mound City, which has been, ex it was demolished in World War I, but has been excavated. And there are lots of remains and artifacts that were collected and are now on display in the restored place. Is that any part of the agenda for this shell mound? Excavating and displaying artifacts? No, but enough has been excavated that if the local community feels it's appropriate, I mean, this is a very sensitive issue these days, right? The display, because when people are buried and their possessions, their jewelry are put with them, I mean, certainly all of us would appreciate if somebody went and dug up our grandparents to get the wedding ring, you know, it's just not okay. And then, so you don't want to put that wedding ring into a museum either. So, um, Telling the story in a sensitive way and recounting the history is definitely of interest. Um, you know, the goal for the the ancestors that were taken away would be a, a respectful burial out of sight. And I would say then you get into the native conversation about is it appropriate to display any of the artifacts or the art pieces that were removed? I showed you an image of some of them. They're gorgeous. But that's a, it's just a really sensitive subject. So, um, you know, you mentioned the mounds, and it, it's really interesting as we as as we uncovered the story of this shell mound in Berkeley, we learned that there were mounds, the Cahokia mounds along the the mm -hmm. Mississippi and Missouri River, and the Ser Serpent Mound, one of the ones you're talking about in Ohio. And um, it's amazing. It's just a normal human endeavor is to is to create these mounds and to bear, do ceremony on top and to build, you know, bury within them. And um, so some form of cultural storytelling place, definitely. But what's on display, that remains to be seen. Thank you for that. that. Back to you, Layla. So we have a question. Uh, so far, we've heard only English. How will the Ohlone language be included from here on? That's a great question. Um, Karina's daughter, Deja, is handling kind of language revitalization within the Confederated Villages of Lejean. Vince Medina is pretty well known for his efforts at bringing the language back. There are, you know, you, you, you may all know the story, but... Um, when the missions arrived here in the Bay in the late six, in the late 1700s and early 1800s, the villages were scattered. The soldiers came, the people were marched off to the missions. They were forced to build the missions. Um, the gold rush swept through. There was a bounty on the heads of native people. So the cultures, particularly in California, in many of these like urban developed areas like Berkeley, were just scattered and the languages really suffered. But there were some recordings made by J.P. Harrington and others. So there are these wax cylinders um, that exist that so they people, local Ohlone people now can listen to their ancestors speak and they're going to try to revive the language. But it's a it's a challenge. And, um, you know, just the word Huchiun, you know, the name of this place, uh, it'll be interesting to see if more more and more people learn that or care to use that um 
English is a pretty dominant language, but there is a lot of language revitalization going on, a lot of resources being put into it. And Native people are really, I think, educating all of us to understand that their worldview is encapsulated in their vocabulary and their grammar, and that their biological, spiritual knowledge requires their language, which is place-based and really um, expressive in ways that English is not. So it's a great question, and I hope that these languages are all revived and that we all learn to respect them and encourage their use. There's a question about the, sh the last short film. Uh, someone wants to know if that's available on a website. Yes, um, my website, the Sacred Land Film Project website is sacredland.org. And that film is the featured film on the homepage. We also have a YouTube channel, which is Sacred Land Film. And if you go there, you'll find 50 different films that are uh, some long, some short, um, outtakes of interviews with some amazing indigenous people. And if you, if you, yeah, so, but yes, that film is on both YouTube and our website, sacredland.org. Thank you. Uh, there's a question, is the process underway to further develop the design concept? I assume this means of the of the uh, the, the one that you showed, not not the not the design concept for housing. No, that's that's gone now, that one. Um, yes. And uh, Chris Walker, who's the uh, artist, landscape architect, uh, his father is Peter Walker, who some of you may know, who has a um, large landscape architecture firm down there on on fourth street uh south of university so chris's father is an internationally known landscape architect and has a firm they did the elevated garden over there at salesforce tower they if you've been to the 9 11 memorial where the water flows down into the black cube uh pwp peter walker designed that so right now we're going through the budget and we're working, you know, the weird thing about this eight years was that we couldn't publicly try to do much like raise money uh, publicly for the vision because we didn't have the land. And so everything was sort of frozen in amber. We did get a $20 million contribution from the Katali Foundation a couple of years ago. And that we asked them for 20 because that was what we were told the land was worth a few years ago. And without a few more contributions and the city of Berkeley, we would not have been able to get up to 27 million to buy it. But now that we have the land, we hope that there's the momentum to raise the money to pay for the professionals to develop that idea. And then we will do the public meetings in that neighborhood amongst Bay Area native community to see if this is the vision people really want and to then keep developing it further. But hopefully there's enough momentum behind that idea that we can just keep keep proceeding with that vision. But yeah, we're, we're working on that now. There's a question here that I think follows up on what you just said, Toby. Uh, someone asked what kinds of support are still needed from us citizens of Berkeley? Yeah, thank you for that. Um, the website that we developed for this campaign is shellmound.org. And there's a, you know, there's a donate button there. Um, we raised over the eight years from that website about $80,000, which paid for the lawyers who fought relentlessly over all those years on that court case. And on the night of the land being turned over to the Ohlone, somebody donated $77,000 <laughs> to, to this campaign. And Karina's comment was, well, that's already gone because the legal bills for the last three months were huge. Uh, so that's a place people can financially support this effort. You probably all have heard about the Shumi land tax, which is a way that people who own property or don't, but live in this area can tithe or pay annually something to the Segorate Land Trust to help support their operations. Segorate is co-founded by Karina Gould and Janella LaRose. 
And you heard from Melissa Nelson. She's one of the board members. It's a women-led indigenous land trust. They now hold the title to the West Berkeley Shell Mound. And I would just say beyond that, um, talking it up as a supportive community member and saying it's worth the Berkeley City Council continuing to put some time and resources into this because we're going to need the city's backing to daylight the creek and to build this, this mound that we have visioned. And, and so we're going to need the city of Berkeley's ongoing support. And the citizens are, are obviously a critical part of that. So um, yeah, thank you for that question. Going back up the list, uh, somebody asked who stenciled the blue West Shell Mound on several West Berkeley streets outlining some border or extent? That, that's a good question. Um, I don't know. This, this is sort of citizen activism in Berkeley, but I bet it was Karina's younger group of people. Um, you know, when I described the hearing um, on in 2018 or so when the California appeals court did the zoom meeting where we were clear they were going to overturn our victory that day, the owners of the land put up a barbed wire fence all the way around the 2.2 acres, which was really painful and sort of an insult. They closed that parking lot. It was during COVID, but barbed wire around the site was, was really an insult to Karina. And that began a process of stenciling, uh, we stenciled birds on the sidewalk all the way around the site, six feet apart. And people, we had a candlelight vigil and about 500 people showed up. We circled the site with candles. It might have been around that time that somebody had the idea of stenciling the West Berkeley Shell Mound sort of perimeter on the sidewalks. We've also um, closed 4th Street a couple of times and painted sacred site on the 4th Street pavement. The city council actually closed Center Street so that we could paint Ohlone territory next to the city council building, the uh, what's it called, city hall, while the UC, I'm sorry, the um, Berkeley High School kids painted Black Lives Matter on the street in front of the high school. So we have sort of city hall surrounded with the local politically correct sort of uh, slogans. I'm not sure who painted those blue uh, <laughs> Blue things on the sidewalks. Okay. Is there a, an indigenous map of all Berkeley? Likely daylighting all of at least more creeks would serve these and environmental concerns. That's a good question. Um, interestingly, um, we've been having some meetings with UC Berkeley uh, around the issues of the cultural significance of that campus because where the faculty uh, center is, uh, there was a major Ohlone village. Memorial Stadium covers a major Ohlone village. Where I work at the David Brower Center, right outside, Strawberry Creek flowed by there, major Ohlone village right there. When you look at a map, which is confidential information, but they shared it with us of where there was cultural significance in Berkeley. You realize all along the water course were people and they were living along the water. Um, so yes, it's sensitive information and I think there'll be maps coming soon. Um, we've decided uh, there's also a move to Daylight Strawberry Creek where the farmer's market is that right at the edge of the Civic Center Plaza there. So that's where Strawberry Creek flowed originally. So we're going to link up attempts to daylight Strawberry Creek on the UC Berkeley campus because they want to free it up under some built, you know, next to some buildings, It's it's been culverted. So we're gonna link the attempts to daylight the creek on the campus by the Civic Center and down at 4th Street. And I would bet that as that movement grows over the next couple of years, cause it takes engineers and it takes money that yeah, we'll, we'll come up with a map you know, Karina's interested in in linking up, for example, Indian Rocks and Mortar Rocks Park, very important cultural area for the Ohlone. And to try to do a map of Berkeley that links the different sites and the, maybe the old trails. I've just figured out recently that Hopkins is like the pathway from the, the Ohlone Shell Mound Village up to the Peralta house that was built by Ohlone people when the Peraltas had their land grant. 
So, you know, you go up Hopkins now and you realize, oh, this is an old trail. And San Pablo, of course, was the north-south route that the Ohlone would take from, from one village to the next as well. Um, so, yeah, I would say some maps are forthcoming, but that's a great idea. I'll, uh, I'll, I'll suggest that to Chris Walker and he can talk to Karina about it. We'll see what we can come up with. That's a good opportunity for Baja to do a quick, uh, quick uh, watch, watch your newsletters and your MailChimps because Baja is looking into doing a, um, an event uh, around the Indian Rock and the Mortar Park uh, coming up pretty soon. And we've been doing a lot of work on trying to figure out exactly how to do it so that it's uh, interesting. And, uh, and I think it's going to be well worth our members and the public's uh, uh, attention. So keep an eye out. Hopefully we'll have, have it ready um, and you'll see an ad for it. Uh, the next one, actually, I think there may be just some confusion. As I understand it from the, from the program, the, actually, the Shell Mound, it, 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 it was added to the National Reg Register of Historic Places, right? It was, it was found eligible for the National Register of Historic Places. And I think right now, some of um, Kent Lightfoot's students are formally putting together the document that's needed to get it actually listed. Uh, it's as it's as good protection as you can get to be eligible, and it's another complicated step to get it actually listed. So we're in the middle of of that. It takes time, resources, and uh, it hasn't quite been completed yet. Can you talk a little bit more about the importance of that view shed? Why why does that matter? Well, one of the more profound moments in this whole journey early on was sitting in Mayor Aragin's office with Karina when she was asking him and the city attorney to not allow the SB 35 permit to go through, when she explained the cosmology of the Shell Mound uh, at a level that I'd, I had never heard. And that was that when someone died and was buried in the Shell Mound, a ceremony would be held on top of the Shell Mound for four days with a fire, and that the spirit of the deceased would wait on Alcatraz Island, for four days until this sort of release and goodbye grieving ceremony was completed. And after four days, the spirit would then be free to go through what Karina calls the Western Gate, which is so beautifully pictured by Chris there without a bridge in it. And on to the, whether you want to call it the Farallones or the Horizon or the spirit world, that is the cosmology that, um, Karina described to the mayor. And yeah, it you can, I mean, I I understand a lot about Berkeley now, knowing this 5,007 year village history based on Strawberry Creek. You know, it's like why we're, I don't know, you're not all living in Berkeley, but um, many of you are. And I was drawn here to graduate school. There's something about this place that's really powerful. And I believe that that view from here out across Alcatraz, looking at those two peninsulas and that opening there, um, you know, all of that attracted the Ohlone originally more than, you know, almost 6,000 years ago. And I'm sure they really appreciated and still do appreciate that view shed. So that's a great question. Okay. I, I'm not sure that you, you know the answer to the next one, which is whether there's a way to clean up and restore Strawberry Creek. I, mean, I don't know that with you there whether that's within your your purview or not. But well, I just talked to Teddy Simon today, who's the Native American liaison at UC Berkeley, and and they just had a meeting yesterday with Karina with the engineers. And part of the goal is to clean up the section of Strawberry Creek that flows through the campus, and to discharge water that is cleaner than it is now as it leaves the campus. So I think there's engineers and water specialists and, you know, then you have to bring in, as Melissa Nelson said, you got to think about the streamside vegetation. You got to get the invasives out of there, bring in the medicine plants and the original uh, foliage that wants to grow along that creek. So a lot of people are thinking about that. And I think that's why Karina wants that to be the next step of what we focus on is linking up these efforts to clean up and daylight and respect that water which obviously has not been respected 
very, I, I must say when I was in graduate school at Berkeley, um, in the journalism department, our TV and documentary film program was in Dwinnell Hall. And whenever I got really stressed out, I walked out the door, I walked over to Strawberry Creek and I just sat there next to the water, you know, flowing by Dwinnell Hall there. And so I'm, I have a kind of, you know, this is like the 1970s and eighties that I discovered Strawberry Creek's kind of healing power. Um, and I think we all would love to see it cleaner and freer and, you know, be able to go and enjoy it. So yeah, we're working on it. I think you may have answered the next question, but let me let me make sure see if you have anything you want to add. The question is: Is there programming in the plan to explain the culture and habits? Absolutely, that would be what the cultural center is all about. You know, Karina talks a lot about fourth graders coming and learning about the values and what the natural history of what uh, the, the Berkeley, the Bay was like before settlement by Europeans and Spaniards and uh, the gold rush and all that. So yeah, natural history, cultural history, um, storytelling about um, the meaning of that place. That's all, that's all part of the plan if we can raise the money and, and pull it off. I want to, I just want to say one thing. I see Lenore Goldman's name there um, on my screen. Um, Lenore and Stephanie and Chris Walker and Claire Greensfelder were sort of this core strategic group that met with Karina over all those years. And I just want to say how that symbolizes the number of people who committed their time and energy tirelessly over these eight years to support, you know, outsider allies who then interfaced with Mayor Aragin and Sophie Hahn and the whole city council and this group that was out there painting murals and um, all the people who came in and prayed at the site. I mean, it was really, the story was really about collaboration and building a community uh, that valued the history of this site. It was really an honor to do the work. And and um, so I just want to shout out to Lenore and, and Stephanie and Chris Walker, who did the so much of the graphics that you just saw and, and you we, know Baja, Baja has been part of it you guys put on some um events over the years that were about Berkeley history and the shell mound and that was all part of the public education that led to the success well uh and we want to thank you it's really been a an interesting program it was beautifully put together and um it was it was really um emotionally touching um, to to see what the uh, history has been. Um, I think at this point, I've asked you all of the questions that I think I can ask and that you can answer. Uh, so I think at this point too, we're getting kind of late. And, uh, but I have to tell you, we've kept almost every single participant all through this program. I've been watching the numbers. So I, I think that's the biggest thank you you could possibly get is that people didn't go off to watch television. So you, you build a lot higher than that. Um, and on behalf of Baja, I would like to thank you uh, very much. And I hope that we can use your assistance again in the future for another program, because this was definitely a very interesting one. Thank you. And uh, that's the end of our program for tonight. Thank you very much, Layla and Carolyn and Elizabeth and all of you for participating. Thanks, good night.